It was the 1800s. America was growing and vast financial empires were being built. Into this era of opportunity, one powerful man emerged, a man who pulled the financial strings of wealthy men and entire countries. A man who brought order to chaos, J. Pierpont Morgan. Twice, he was called on by American presidents to save the nation's economy. Both times, he was criticized for wielding the power to be able to do so. He amassed a personal fortune, spending his riches in ways that inspired some and outraged others. He was corpulent and intimidating. One contemporary said meeting his blazing dark eyes was like confronting the headlights of an express train bearing down on you. J. Pierpont Morgan was as powerful as a world leader. Wall Street was his empire. In 1837, the new steam engine was beginning to transform America, creating new and exciting opportunities. It was into this world of possibility that John Pierpont Morgan was born on April 17th in Hartford, Connecticut. The eldest son of Junius Spencer Morgan, a well-to-do businessman, and Juliet Pierpont Morgan, the daughter of a fiery preacher and poet. Young Pierpont was greatly influenced by both of his grandfathers. Every Sunday, he accompanied his grandfather, Joseph Morgan, to the local Episcopal church. Pierpont loved the services, especially when it came to singing the hymns. His other grandfather, the Reverend John Pierpont, was known for his radical sermons about politics and religion. He was eventually forced to leave his pulpit because of his ideas. From his Pierpont grandfather, uh, uh, Morgan got a streak of uh, romanticism, a streak of uh, morality, and even a certain crusading streak that would be very important in his life. This crusading streak of Pierpont's was evident while he was at school. He proved himself to be a natural leader among the other children. Pierpont's father noticed his son's abilities and over the years groomed him for a career in business. He raised his son, Pierpont, with a great deal of love, but also a great deal of discipline. Junius Spencer Morgan expected that his son would follow in his footsteps and succeed in uh, the business world. But illness plagued Pierpont and often kept him out of school. From the time that he was a boy, he really had two personalities. One was this very jolly, animated, high-spirited, outgoing boy with tremendous energy and health. But then he would suddenly get these fainting spells, and that uh, was accompanied by a personality that was more that of a brooding loner. Forced by illness to spend time alone, Pierpont perfected the game of solitaire, a game he played to relax when he felt tense or nervous. As his health improved, Pierpont spent much of his time accompanying his family to art galleries and concerts. It was at this time that he began to develop a lifelong appreciation for the arts. Pierpont Morgan started collecting as a child. He was very interested in uh, collecting historic autographs, particularly of great Americans. Pierpont's interest in history served him well when he returned to high school. He wrote his commencement essay on his hero, Napoleon Bonaparte, a man whose power he was determined to emulate. Pierpont's father was looking for a position of power himself. And in 1854, he accepted a job at the Peabody Bank in London. It was an incredible opportunity. Junius would gain access to wealthy European bankers who in turn could provide capital to help build a burgeoning America. Pierpont was 17 when Junius moved the family abroad. Soon, he was on his way to college in Germany, where he showed a remarkable aptitude for mathematics. After his first year at the university, Pierpont's father decided it was time for his son to begin his career. 
and arranged for him to be given a job in a New York City banking firm. At 20 years of age, Pierpont left his family behind and sailed for New York, ready to strike out on his own. Pierpont began his business career as a clerk at a Wall Street bank. He worked hard, was orderly and absolutely methodical, and he could add numbers with lightning speed. Despite long hours and dedication to his work, Pierpont also began to build a healthy social life in the city. He worked his way into the finest social circles. He made influential friends and cultivated business contacts that helped him build his career. He was often a guest in the homes of New York's most prominent families. And it was one such visit that changed his life. At a social gathering, Pierpont was introduced to the daughter of a well-to-do family. Her name was Amelia Sturgis, or Mimi. Pierpont was captivated by Mimi, and her family soon embraced this ambitious young man whose own family was across the Atlantic. When Pierpont wasn't visiting Mimi, he was searching for new opportunities. Pierpont had big dreams and was determined to find a way to turn them into realities. He wrote to his father frequently, sharing his personal observations and thoughts about business and life in New York City. Pierpont's insights and abilities showed a young man with great potential, and the partners at the firm were beginning to take notice. Pierpont was young, but showed remarkable business instincts, instincts that were soon to be tested. In 1860, the firm sent Pierpont south for a first-hand account of the cotton and shipping business. In Cuba, young Pierpont sampled his first Havana cigar, the beginning of a lifelong passion. From Cuba, he went to New Orleans, where he stumbled upon a business opportunity that he couldn't resist. But it was not without risk. A local sea captain was stuck with a shipload of coffee and no buyer. Immediate action was required or the coffee would spoil. Using the firm's money, Pierpont purchased the coffee and set about selling it to New Orleans merchants. He pulled it off managing to turn a tidy little profit in the process. In New York, the partners of the bank weren't impressed. They were angry and felt the venture was risky. But Morgan believed that fortune smiles on those who act fast, and he believed his instincts about people would always make him a winner. He said the real risk was that he had misjudged the character of the captain and that the captain would have lied to him. And this is sort of the, the quintessential issue of Morgan, that he was able to look at people and immediately make a judgment of their character and of their integrity, and one of his greatest strengths. With his modest success in New Orleans, Pierpont soon found that his ambition outstripped the opportunities the bank offered so in 1861, impatient and determined to set off on his own, he left the bank to go into business for himself. Pierpont worked with his father to invest European money into American industry. Times were turbulent, however. Civil war threatened the country. But young Pierpont was smart and was backed by a powerful and influential father. America needed capital to grow and Pierpont Morgan wanted in on the action of supplying it. But embers of North-South anger were soon fanned into the flames of civil war, and young men were going off to fight, shedding their blood for the Union cause. Like other young men of means, Pierpont was able to avoid the draft. He paid a substitute $300 to take his place, and called him the other J.P. Morgan. Not fighting in the war enabled Pierpont to concentrate on his work. And business was booming. Long hours at the office were made bearable by his blossoming love affair with Mimi. Pierpont was coming into his own. 
but his personal fortunes eventually took a turn for the worse. During the summer of 1861, three years after they had met, Mimi was diagnosed with tuberculosis, almost always fatal in the 19th century. Pierpont was devastated. Immediately, he took control of the situation. He proposed to Mimi, promising her that he'd help find a cure. He was deeply in love with Mimi. He married her in the family house in New York. In fact, he had to carry her downstairs for the ceremony. Pierpont immediately took Mimi to Algiers for their honeymoon. He thought the tropical climate might save her. When Mimi's condition worsened, he brought the best specialists to attend to her. But his efforts were in vain. Four months after their marriage, on February 17, 1862, Mimi died in Pierpont's arms. Here's an extraordinary outpouring of somebody trying to control life in some way. Uh, it was a terrible loss for him, and he failed. But he knew what he was getting into, oddly enough. He was daring, and almost he was daring death in some sort of dramatic way, and attempting to control it. The ordered, controlled life that Pierpont had made for himself was turned upside down, imbued with a dark chaos. He made plans to return to New York. He didn't know how he would survive the ordeal. In the winter of 1862, Pierpont Morgan's beloved wife of only four months had died in his arms. He returned to New York a changed man. The loss was so powerful that in a way it forced him to keep his genuinely emotional nature under tight control. Pierpont immersed himself in his business. It helped him deal with the loss of Mimi. He continued to work with his father, directing European investments into American industry. Pierpont was looking for a larger platform, but for now, attending to his father's wishes kept him busy and helped him overcome his grief. However, not all his time was taken up with his new business ventures. He found distraction and entertainment in his social activities around town. Pierpont also remembered the comfort that the Episcopal Church had offered when he attended Mass with his grandfather Morgan. He joined St. George's Church and immersed himself in its activities. As he continued to grieve for Mimi, the church provided a type of redemption that Pierpont didn't expect. It was there that he met the young, beautiful Fanny Tracy. The daughter of a prominent attorney, she was at first put off by Pierpont's gruff demeanor, but soon she warmed to his affections. After a year-long courtship, Pierpont and Fanny were married at St. George's Church on May 31, 1865. In their first year together, Fanny gave birth to a daughter. They named her Louisa. Over the next several years, Fanny gave Pierpont a son and two more daughters. Pierpont bought a beautiful summer home for his growing family. It was a large Victorian house with a view of the Hudson River. But once again, Pierpont's health began to fail. He was plagued by frequent headaches and dizzy spells. He also suffered from a skin condition called acne rosacea. It uh, had the terrible effect of, of uh, inflating his nose, and it was really just a, an awful eyesore. And for that reason, all the pictures of Pierpont are actually retouched to reduce the size of his nose. Pierpont's doctors recommended rest and relaxation. He took their advice by choosing a new hobby that not only improved his health, but his business prospects as well. He bought a 165-foot yacht and named it the Corsair. On the Corsair, business and pleasure went hand in hand. Pierpont's prospects were bright. At 33 years of age, he had a beautiful family, a yacht, two homes, and was earning more than $75,000 a year. 
a huge amount in a time when $2,000 was a comfortable living. He even thought of retiring, but once again, his father intervened. To change Pierpont's mind, Junius suggested a partnership with the powerful banker Anthony Drexel. Under Pierpont's leadership, the new company quickly became a powerhouse in international finance. Pierpont's power grew rapidly, and with it, his reputation as a man who could influence events. With all thoughts of retirement completely out of his head, Pierpont was determined to make his mark. In 1879, he got his chance. He was approached by William H. Vanderbilt, heir to the Vanderbilt fortune. Vanderbilt wanted to sell 250,000 shares of stock in the New York Central Railway. The deal was tricky. Such a vast sum was involved that chaos in the market was almost guaranteed. Well, Pierpont accepted the challenge and with a combination of stealth, cunning, and brilliance, pulled off the near impossible feat. He successfully sold all of Vanderbilt's shares without shaking the market. For Pierpont, the Vanderbilt deal was a turning point. In return for his services, he had demanded a seat on the New York Central's board of directors. It was a brilliant power play and gave Pierpont financial control over the railway. It was a tactic to gain control that Pierpont would use often. It was said that he would serve on the board of all of the companies that he was interested in, uh, but that the chairman of the board was always wherever J.P. Morgan sat. The financial world began to take serious notice of Pierpont Morgan. He was fast becoming Wall Street's darling deal maker, and his reputation for business savvy was matched only by his reputation for getting what he wanted. Physically, Morgan was a, an overwhelming presence. He had piercing black eyes uh, that could seem to look through people and read their minds. He had his enormous uh, disfigured, discolored nose that intimidated people, uh, and he knew it. Morgan was called upon to use his power and influence to clean up another financial mess. Two of the largest railroads in America were locked in a destructive financial battle. They had built lines next to each other in their attempts to compete. But competition had created chaos. Money was wasted on unproductive and unprofitable new tracks. Collapse of one or both of these railroads was imminent and would spell disaster for investors, many of whom were represented by Junius and Pierpont Morgan. Pierpont was called in to help. As far as the British investors were concerned, uh, the, the railroads were the, uh, the Wild West, wild, woolly, and lawless, and they felt that uh, uh, Pierpont Morgan was the sheriff who would ride in and clean it up. Pierpont's strategy was a stroke of genius that revealed his determination to have things his way. His solution was to call a meeting of railroad owners aboard his yacht, just a leisurely boat ride along the Hudson to discuss a possible agreement. Once aboard, Morgan let the men know that he expected a compromise. Time passed. The boat sailed up and down the Hudson River. It was soon apparent that Morgan would not let the railroad owners off the boat until they came to an agreement. Morgan was a very flamboyant and almost operatic figure, and like all great actors, he liked to have great stage sets for his big set pieces. He found that very often, in order to um, get a business deal, it helped to isolate people and also to set a deadline. Morgan's plan worked. The railway owners agreed to stay out of each other's territory. Morgan's outrageous tactics earned the agreement a special name. It became known as the Corsair Pact. By the end of the 19th century, Pierpont Morgan had become a tycoon in his own right. He was no longer living in the shadow of his father. But once again, just as he was enjoying his success, a series of personal tragedies struck. In the winter of 1884, Pierpont's mother, Juliet, died in London. 
Then in April of 1889, Pierpont took Fanny and their children to visit his father in the south of France. It was the last time they would see Junius alive. In April of 1890, Junius Morgan was killed in a carriage accident. The death of his father signaled a change in Pierpont Morgan's own life. Junius's estate was worth over $14 million, and Pierpont received the lion's share. I think that Pierpont Morgan's father's death did have a profound effect upon him. I think that effect was a liberating one. When his father died in 1890, it set Pierpont Morgan free. One of the first things Morgan did with his large inheritance was to build a bigger, more elaborate yacht. This one measured over 241 feet, one of the largest pleasure vessels afloat. When somebody asked Morgan how much it cost to keep such a large yacht, he answered, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Between the yachting ventures and the business deals, Morgan's family saw little of him. While he may have spent a lot of time away from home, Morgan still had a profound effect on his children. His only son, Jack, was groomed as the heir apparent. After graduating from Harvard in 1889, he began work as an apprentice on Wall Street. Jack, like Pierpont, followed his father into the family business. And business was booming. Morgan's bank acquired more companies, placing Morgan and his partners on boards of directors all over the country. But the American economy was fragile, and in 1893, the stock market crashed. The nation was thrown into a devastating depression. More than 100 railroads declared bankruptcy, causing a domino effect that threatened other businesses and promised complete collapse of the economy. Once again, powerful men called upon Pierpont Morgan to bail them out. Morgan reorganized the railroads by streamlining operations and was quickly able to reverse the downward spiral. But his help came at a price. Morgan gained financial control over many of the companies he had consolidated. His far-reaching control coined a new term, remorganization. Morgan was becoming one of the most powerful men in the world, and powerful enemies were beginning to emerge. By 1893, J. Pierpont Morgan was one of the most powerful men in America. But life wasn't all business for Morgan. He frequently traveled to Europe, voraciously collecting rare books and great art. Shortly after his father's death in 1890, he began to collect on a massive scale. And within a very short time, he became, quite simply, the greatest art collector of modern times. He had only one steadfast rule. If he wanted it, he bought it. He was intent on owning the world's greatest art. His efforts invited comparisons to Napoleon, a parallel to Morgan's childhood idol that would have thrilled him. He once wrote a letter to his sister saying, um, I'm done with the Greek antiquities. I am now at the Egyptians. He was like a freight train going from one period of art history to another. He was like a freight train in business as well. He was now 58 years old, and his personal share in his company was worth more than $4 million. But Morgan was still looking to expand his influence. The opportunity almost brought disaster. As a result of the Depression of 1893, the federal government's gold reserves had dropped to an alarmingly low level. Without gold, the government's guarantee to pay its debts was meaningless. Foreign banks, heavily invested with American assets, became alarmed and began withdrawing even more gold. By 1894, the situation was so grim that it looked as though the United States government would go broke. Morgan moved fast. He devised a plan in which American and European bankers would invest gold directly in the government, saving it from collapse. 
The offer of relief was quickly taken to the President of the United States, Grover Cleveland. Morgan played solitaire in his library as he awaited the President's response. When the answer finally came, it was a disappointment. The President had rejected Morgan's plan. Instead, he backed a plan to raise the money by selling bonds directly to the public. Even if President Cleveland had agreed with Morgan, his hands were tied. Only Congress could borrow money for the United States. And many congressmen were determined to keep Wall Street power brokers like Morgan from controlling the Treasury's coffers. But Morgan knew that the government didn't have time to sell bonds to the public. He was certain that his plan was the nation's only hope. Determined to get his way, Morgan sped to Washington, but was told that the president would not see him. Morgan's reply was swift and gruff. I have come down to Washington to see the president, and I'm going to stay here until I see him. I think Pierpont Morgan certainly felt that he was the equal of the president of the United States. The next morning, word came from the White House that Morgan would be received. During the meeting with the president and other cabinet members, the United States Treasurer was given an urgent message. Turning to the group, he announced that only $9 million in gold was left in the Treasury. Morgan seized that opportunity. He pointed out that he knew of a $10 million draft about to be presented against the Treasury. If that $10 million draft is presented, you can't meet it, declared Morgan. It will be all over by 3 o'clock. President Cleveland thought it over. What suggestions do you have to make, Mr. Morgan? Morgan had a plan. He had discovered an outdated statute from the Civil War. It allowed the Treasury to buy gold. No longer used, but still in effect, it was the loophole needed to circumvent Congress and allow the Treasury to implement Morgan's plan. President Cleveland agreed. Within days, the flow of gold began to run back into the Treasury, completely halting the financial crisis. Many hailed Morgan as a hero, praising his patriotism and selflessness. Others accused him of manipulating the government and collecting a profit. People began to decide that Pierpont had too much power to be able to save the government of the United States. It's an extraordinary thing. And therefore, the only way that he could have done it is by having some sort of evil uh, capability. With the chaos, uncertainty, and intense criticism that often plagued Morgan's life, there was one source of stability, St. George's Church. The Reverend Rainsford, one of the few close friends Morgan had, said, Sometimes I found him kneeling in prayer or reading or singing a hymn without organ and alone. No one but the aged Sexton and myself knew that the great master of men and things was worshiping in the temple. But this great master of men and things had another side. Morgan was known for enormous appetites. He consumed enormous quantities of port, of sherry, and wine with dinner. He had breakfasts so large they could have killed a horse. His appetites extended to other areas as well. He was often seen in the company of women other than his wife and was known to throw extravagant parties on the Corsair. It was said that he lavished his women with gifts of diamonds, furs, and money. His name was connected romantically with theater stars Maxine Elliott and Lillian Russell. He was a very strong believer in the double standard, as, even as he became involved with other women, uh, Pierpont once made a very telling comment that uh, there are always two reasons why a man does something, a good reason and the real reason. And he was always very respectful of Fanny. He was very discreet about the various escapades that he went through. Morgan's passionate nature extended to his business enterprises. In 1901, he undertook the largest business transaction in modern history, the purchase of Carnegie Steel. Carnegie Steel was the crown jewel in the Morgan Empire. When asked to name his price, 
Andrew Carnegie jotted down a figure on the back of an envelope. Morgan looked at the price, $493 million, and immediately said, I accept. With Carnegie Steel under his belt, Morgan formed the United States Steel Corporation in March of 1901. Its stock was valued at $1,400,000,000. Morgan had created the world's first billion-dollar corporation. But his enormous power now brought public scrutiny. After his creation of U.S. Steel, he controlled somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the American steel industry. He controlled a third of American railways at a time when railway stocks comprised 60 percent of all the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. So the American public could be forgiven for imagining that Mr. J. Pierpont Morgan owned the United States. Morgan had reached the pinnacle of his power, and it looked as though nothing could stop him. Right after the creation of U.S. Steel, Morgan formed another massive company, merging two of the nation's largest railroads. It was called Northern Securities. To Morgan, the company would provide stability among the railroads, positively influencing the American economy. To others, it was a monopoly that gave J. Pierpont Morgan a carte blanche to amass more wealth and power. With his unprecedented success on Wall Street, Morgan thought that his power and control could easily be extended to Washington politics. His influence helped William McKinley, a friend to big business, become president of the United States. But on September 6, 1901, McKinley was cut down by an assassin's bullet and died eight days later. With McKinley gone from the White House and public opinion turning against big business, Morgan soon confronted a man whose power equaled his own. New York in 1901 was buzzing with power, money, and influence. And in the center of it all was the most powerful man in the nation, J. Pierpont Morgan. He had a very powerful presence. Descriptions of him walking up and down Wall Street, pushing people out of the way. But the fact is, he didn't have to push people out of the way. They saw him coming and they leapt out of the way. And he needed all his power and influence as events forced Morgan into the toughest fight of his life. Theodore Roosevelt became president after McKinley's assassination and immediately set out to rethink government's support of big business. He was an unknown entity, but to the extent that people in New York knew his record, they also knew that he was something of a loose cannon who had gone on record as criticizing businessmen. Four months after Roosevelt became president, Morgan found out firsthand where that cannon was pointing. The Attorney General of the United States, Delander C. Knox, set out to prosecute Morgan's Northern Securities Company for breach of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Roosevelt was determined to break up the trusts and return power to the little guy, and he would use Morgan to set the example. For the second time in his career, Morgan rushed to Washington to see the president. In a meeting at the White House, Morgan protested to Roosevelt that he should have been given a chance to restructure Northern Securities himself. That is just what we did not want you to do, the president replied. If we have done anything wrong, said Morgan, send your man to my man and they can fix it up. That can't be done, Roosevelt said. The attorney general added, we don't want to fix it. We want to stop it. Morgan was furious. No politician would tell J. Pierpont Morgan how to run his business. Morgan went to the courts and fought the breakup of his company. But the decision was upheld by the Supreme Court. Northern Securities was officially dissolved. Pierpont Morgan resented Theodore Roosevelt, finally. And once when he heard that Roosevelt was going off to Africa on a safari, Morgan said, Good. I hope the first lion that meets him does his duty. Morgan knew he had been beaten, but he wasn't about to give up. He was still powerful and just as determined to control and influence events as ever. 
Despite their father's frequent absences and his immersion in business affairs, Morgan's children were successful and well-established in their personal lives. Morgan delighted in his grandchildren. His gruff demeanor softened when he was around them. With his children on their own, Morgan had more time to pursue his travels and his collecting. But his purchases had outgrown his house, so he decided that he would have a library built to display his treasures. He spared no expense. That a building of this magnitude would be built as a private library for a private person in New York was an extraordinary thing. Morgan also gave enormous amounts of money away. In addition to his numerous charities, he gave close to $2 million to build monuments to his father at Harvard University and the Wadsworth Athenaeum, a museum in his hometown of Hartford. It was in his new library, however, that Morgan would achieve his final crowning glory. In the fall of 1907, another panic hit Wall Street. One of America's largest trust companies had collapsed, sending shockwaves throughout the American economy. In Washington, President Roosevelt saw political disaster loom large. Immediate action was required, and Roosevelt's advisors knew that there was only one man with the power to save the nation. The president who had prosecuted Morgan for having too much control was about to hand that control back to him. Roosevelt sent the Secretary of the Treasury to New York with $25 million in government funds to be placed at Morgan's disposal. Morgan used the money strategically and bought the national economy some time. But there was more work to be done. The public was in a panic. Trusts were continuing to fail as people rushed to withdraw their money. The situation looked desperate, but Morgan had a plan. He reasoned that by rescuing the failing trust, it might reverse the downturn and restore public confidence. He knew the answer was to get the larger trusts to invest money in their weaker competitors. This wasn't easy, but Morgan's powers of persuasion were unmatched. He gathered the trust company presidents in his study in the library beneath the gaze of his statues of saints and Madonnas. He cast a long, penetrating look at each man and launched into a plea for cooperation that at times sounded like a command. He left the presidents to debate the merits of the plan. Morgan then walked to the front door of the library, locked it, and removed the key. He retired to another room and played solitaire, waiting for a solution. Hours passed, and still the men could not agree on Morgan's plan. But they would agree eventually. Morgan had locked them in. No matter what it took, the bankers would see things Morgan's way, or they'd stay in his library forever. With the entire economy in peril, the nation's most influential men were locked in Pierpont Morgan's library. All night, they tried in vain to work out a solution to the financial crisis. Throughout the night, the bankers went to Morgan with compromises or other suggestions. And he would be sitting at the desk and he would be flipping his cards. And uh, one of his lieutenants would come in and say, uh, Mr. Morgan, the they bank presidents have proposed a $10 million loan. And he would be flipping his cards and he would look up and he would say, it's not enough. Flick his cards again. In the early hours of the morning, Morgan marched into the study. The men still had not come to a solution, but Morgan had. He pushed a contract drawn up by his partners and a pen into the hand of the leader of the trust company presidents. He pointed to the contract and said, here's the place and here's the pen. Completely exhausted and beaten down, the president signed and the others followed. The trusts had agreed to contribute to the $25 million pool. Within days, the economy rallied. Morgan's return to Wall Street during the Panic of 1907 signaled the last time that the United States would allow a banker to control the nation's resources the way Morgan had. Soon, the federal government set up formal agencies to do what Morgan had done single-handedly, protect the national economy. 
Prior to 1913, we did not have a Federal Reserve Board in this country. We had J. Pierpont Morgan. He was like a one-man central bank. Shortly after the crisis of 1907, Morgan went into semi-retirement. He was tired. Now in his 70s, he spent time traveling and collecting art. In the United States, the debate over Morgan's influence continued. Public opinion turned firmly against big business. In 1912, a Senate committee was set up to investigate what they termed the money trusts on Wall Street. Morgan was ordered to appear in Washington in December. Samuel Untermeyer, an affluent New York City trial lawyer, asked the questions for the committee. Morgan was grilled for hours, but in one line of questioning, he was able to redeem his actions in the eyes of a wary public. Untermeyer asked Morgan, is not commercial credit based primarily upon money or property? Morgan answered, no, sir. The first thing is character. Before money or property, Untermeyer countered. Before money or anything else, Morgan replied. Money cannot buy it because a man I do not trust could not get money from me on all the bonds in Christendom. Spectators applauded. Morgan had stated the banking philosophy on which he had built his empire. But his reign as the emperor of American finance was over. The country embraced the 20th century. The banking world moved forward without Pierpont Morgan. As soon as the hearings were over, Morgan returned to his travels. But Pierpont Morgan's time ran out. On March 31st, 1913, he died in his sleep in a hotel in Rome. He was 75. Thousands of people flocked to St. George's Church for Pierpont Morgan's funeral. His body was taken to Hartford, where he was buried in the family plot. As a final tribute, the New York Stock Exchange stayed closed that morning, one of the few times in its history. Upon his death, Morgan's personal fortune was estimated at over $68 million. His art collection alone was worth another $60 million. His wife, Fanny, lived well into her 80s, dying in the home she shared with her husband. Morgan's son, Jack, took control of J.P. Morgan & Company, which held control over banking and other institutions with assets of over $2 billion. The firm still exists today. Morgan left his greatest treasure, his art collection, to the American people. Many of his works were donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Wadsworth Athenaeum. The Pierpont Morgan Library, opened to the public in 1924, stands as a beautiful monument to the awesome power that one man was able to amass in the course of a lifetime. In a way, Pierpont Morgan is our Napoleon. We're fascinated by him. We're fascinated by his sense of control over his environment. We're fascinated by his successes. We're even more fascinated by his failures and his escapes. After Morgan's death, his once bitter rival, Theodore Roosevelt, summed up Morgan's life. Mr. Morgan was politically opposed to me, yet whenever I was brought into contact with him, I was struck not only by his very great power, but by his sincerity and truthfulness. J. Pierpont Morgan used his integrity and his influence to transform Wall Street at the turn of the century. In the process, he changed America forever.